God has always been into the impossible. He always is into, uh, you know, he, he, you can't put him in a box because God will do something that you can't even think about. It's the, the Bible puts it this way. It says it's more than we can think or even imagine. Uh, today, I want to talk to you for a little while about aggressive faith. I want to talk to you about a faith that moves some things, a faith that will push, a faith that will pull, a faith that will build a bridge, a faith that will break down barriers, a faith that will get you through. And so today I want to just remind you of a couple of things, and I'll start with this story. Um, There's a story of a man who um, lived in the country, and uh, this they lived off of an old country road, and he had... um, uh, a farm, you know, of old dirt, muddy road. And one night, this farmer got a knock on the door. The road was quite nasty and muddy and slippery and so forth. And so he had, uh, he got a knock on the door. And this was back in the old days. And this, uh, this uh, farmer uh, notices somebody outside, opens the door, and it's a truck driver. And a transfer truck had slid off into a ditch. And the man, this was back in the day when you could ask somebody to borrow their phone. So he asked, uh, he asked the old gentleman, he said, sir, uh, can I borrow your phone? I need to make a phone call. I've gotten my truck stuck in a ditch and I've got to call somebody to help me. And the old farmer said, well, that's not a big deal. Said, I've got a mule. I bet I can pull that thing out. And the man just kind of smiled at him and, uh, said, well, I don't, I don't think so. And he said, let's, let's look. Let's go out and give it a try. So, son of a gun, they hooked that old mule to the front of that diesel truck. And the old man said, crank the truck up. And when I tell you to give some gas, you give it some gas. And so, the, the old man got his whip out. And he would, he would uh, he'd tell the man, crank the truck up and give it some gas. And he would pop that whip and he would holler, Psh, pull, Billy Bob, pull. And he'd pop that whip again, Psh, and he'd say, pull, Bobby boy, pull. And he'd crack that whip again, and he would holler, pull, Bobo boy, pull. And in just a minute, that truck started to get some traction, and that truck started to pull out of that ditch, And son of a gun, if that old mule didn't pull that truck, slap out the ditch, got it up on the road where he could uh, go about his way, and the trucker got out, and he said, I I tell you what, sir, said, I'm amazed. He said, "Uh, but I have a question for you. He said, "You, you cracked that whip, and you said, pull, Bobby boy. And then you cracked that whip again, and you said, pull, Billy boy. Then you cracked that whip again, and you said, pull, Bobby boy. He said, sir, they ain't but one mule out here. He said, what, 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 what were you doing? He said, oh, that's easy. He said, he always pulls harder when he thinks he's got some help. Let, let, I'm, and here's why I'm going to start that way, because I want to talk about faith, but I want to talk about a faith that will pull some things and push some things. See, some people think faith is all about getting me to heaven, and I say faith is all about getting heaven to you. I say faith is has to be a lot of things. One of the things we could talk about is the shield of faith, but I don't want to go there this morning. We could talk about faith that does get you saved, faith that gets you delivered, faith that does a lot of things. But I want to talk to you today about the pull of faith and why people are important. Because I'm going to tell you something in times of struggle and in times of trial, I could talk to you about the promise, the P-U-L-L, and I could have made the P about the promise, but most of you know your promise. What you really need more than anything is somebody around you that will say, hey, I'm with you all the way. I'm going to help you pull or push. I'll do whatever it takes. If you have somebody, listen, every one of us seem to do better when we feel like somebody's working with us. When you feel like It's just you against the world. Life gets tough. It's always a headwind somewhere. But I'm going to tell you something. When you get to a place where where you know 
somebody standing beside you and you know, yes, it's easy for me to say, God's going to be there for you. He'll always be with you. you. You may be alone, but you don't ever have to be lonely. I can say all those things and they would be true. But I'm telling you, when you have somebody, a prayer partner, a friend, a relative, a loved one, somebody that will pull with you, somebody that will stand with you, that's what the church of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be about. If somebody would just pull with me a little bit, there are people in this room this morning that need the pull of another person. If, if they need the kind of faith that says, to a person, if I just had the faith of a few close friends to get me to Jesus, I don't even have a way. I may be on a sick bed and I can't get there. But if I just had a way for somebody to take me where I can't go by myself. And if you know what happened, they tore the roof off the thing. They tore the roof off the thing to get the friend to Jesus. I need some friends that will tear the roof off the mother if they have to. I need some friends that will say, I'm with you, Pastor. I'm with you. And and we need a community of faith. We need people that will say, I I don't always know what God's doing in your life, but man, one thing for sure, you can always count on me. I need somebody to pull with you, Scott. Sometimes I just need somebody to pull with me because I pull better if I think I got some help. The entire thing, what I love about a team concept is you don't have to do it all by yourself. What I love about team sports, what I love about the the body of Christ, the many-membered body of Christ is I don't have to feel like I have to do it all. I just need somebody that will work with me just a little bit. Just work with me for a minute. Just work with me. Stand with me. If you have to, push me forward. Pull me forward. Do whatever you have to do. But say, we're going on with Jesus. I'm going on with Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm I'm telling you. So I want to talk to you today. The first point being is the people that you surround yourself with. Because people, yes, relationships are God's idea. And people have the power to do one or two things. People have the power to absolutely uh, discourage you. People have the power to, 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 they won't be in agreement with you. How are two going to walk together except they agree? How are we going to walk together unless we agree? I just just want you to agree. And here's the thing. We, We use that scripture all the time. If, if two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst. Or we'll say things like, um, if two shall agree as touching anything, it's going to be done. Well, what if, what if you and I touch and agree with heaven? He ain't agreeing with us. We're getting in agreement with what he's already done. One of the things that's a difficulty, and I'm, I'm bad about using this language, and I want to caution you because it can be decent language, but sometimes it limits you, and that's this language. Because there's a language that goes along with spirit things, and I'll get to that in a minute, but there's a language where we'll say things like, well, uh, you know, um, I'm just trying to be what God would have me to be. And I caution you with that language because it's not that we don't want you to be, but think about this. When you say that, when I'm just trying to be what God wants me to be, you're already saying this is a standard that I'm not at. And what God wants to do is God wants to, uh, He wants you to step into the place that He's already created for you. So now I'm not trying to get somewhere that I'm not. I'm trying to walk into the position that He's already given me in Christ Jesus. I couldn't get there by myself. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is the pool of faith, the people around you. How important it is for you to be a voice of encouragement to your friend. What about this? I've been quoting this scripture a lot. I think I used it last week. Job 42.10, God turned the captivity of Job when he just prayed for a friend. That's a, think about that. Just by praying for somebody else, God begins to do something for me. He turned... The captivity of Job, just because Job said a prayer for somebody else. That's a God thing right there. You better hear me. That's a God thing right there. 
When you, a part of it is, is you get your mind off of you for a minute. Because some of the things that happen in church is this, we can get that it's all about me mentality. It's all about me. And here's what I'm beginning to be more and more mindful of. Sometimes I don't need to be thinking about me. Sometimes it ain't. Listen, every promise is for you. We could talk about the you all day long. But I wish you'd go back in your Bible and a lot of verses that we quote, we quote them in the singular when in fact they're plural. You are not the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you understood, if you were to just do a Bible study and go back and look at how many times there's this we thing instead of a me thing. See, some of you are so so worried about your breakthrough and your blessing and God's going to give that to you. But it's a we thing. He's a we some God. He's a we some God. He's awesome, but there's a we in there. Amen? Because I need somebody that'll pull with me. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? High five your neighbor and say, pull with me. Pull with me. Pull with me. Hallelujah. And then secondly, I want to talk to you about your understanding. Because some people don't understand some things. They don't have a proper understanding of how God works. And so they make decisions. Their decisions lead them to a place. And then if you're not careful, you'll blame God for something He didn't even tell you to do. You'll blame God. You'll, you'll put some things on God that ain't even on God. He, he, he didn't tell you to do some of this. Look, I, I made a stupid decision one time. And... um. I decided back in the day I was going to buy, I found a Mercedes Benz on eBay. Hallelujah. It was, yeah, I got to be like frozen. I got to let it go. But I did make the mistake of buying a car, a sight unseen, went on and bid on it. I'm thinking, it's well, it's about half price. It's, man, it's a Benz. How, how bad could it really be? Trust me, it was bad. God didn't tell me. I didn't even ask him. if I wasn't trying to impress anybody. I just saw a car for half price. I thought, man, this is too good to be true. And most of the time it is. Yes, it is. (laughs) Most of the time it's too good to be true. You know, that's that's, to a point that's true. But you know what's too good to be true that nobody can even say anything about? And that is, it's too good to be true that he suffered, bled, and died on a cross so that I could have eternal life. And all I have to do is believe it. All I have to do is believe it. It is too good to be true. That's why it's called the good news because it's the gospel. But in my situation, I flew down, picked up my car. I guess we probably drove, we financed it. We, we were all good. Uh, we drove it for, I don't know, maybe 18 months to two years or something like that. That bad boy was set in my backyard, and it I paid the payment on it, three hundred twenty some dollars a month for about the next three years. I should have asked my wife. See, if it God would have sounded just like her. I thank God for wives that will let you do what you feel like you're supposed to do. Hallelujah. <laughs> she's just, she's just uh and what, what I'm saying is, is look, we've all made stupid decisions and called it, it wasn't God's fault. I never blamed God, but there are people all the time that make crazy, stupid decisions and call it God. The, the greatest thing that God ever gave you was the power of choice. You get to choose. You get to choose. You get to choose your attitude. You get to choose your gratitude. You get to choose. You get to choose. Make sure you choose wisely. So the second thing is understanding how God works, understanding the things of God. In all of your getting, the Bible says, get understanding. While you're getting houses and cars and lands, if you don't get you some understanding, they'll be gone before too long. If you don't get you some understanding, you, things will happen and you'll be blaming the wrong person. Things will happen and you'll be saying, what has God done to me? And he say, I didn't tell you to marry her in that way. I didn't tell you to do that. I didn't tell you to, you didn't even ask me. Now you're blaming me. I can't get any help. Amen. 
But Hebrews 11.3 says this. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand. Now, if you were to understand what that means, by faith we understand, it, it's a perception, it's in the mind. Think about this. This is a spiritual concept. Faith allows me to understand a thing and perceive it in my mind even though I haven't seen it yet. Maybe I don't understand the concept. You get into the things of God and you start hearing uh, concepts like, except a corn of, of corn of wheat die and fa- fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. And you go, what is he talking about? I ain't even a farmer. But there's a concept there that if your mind can perceive it by faith, you will understand that somebody made some sacrifices. First of all, Christ made a sacrifice for me. But secondly, in families and in communities, if if you want to see movement in the right direction, oftentimes somebody has to make a sacrifice. Amen. Somebody in the family had to make sacrifice. Somebody had to get up and do whatever it took to pay the bills to get you where you are. Somebody had to understand. So these are spiritual concepts that by faith, I understand the thing. By faith, I understand uh, according to uh, what the Word says. I'm going to read it to you just so you can hear and understand. Hebrews, most of you know this the chapter very well. But by through faith, that's what it says, not by faith, but through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Through faith, I understand some things that otherwise wouldn't make sense to me. It don't make any sense that you realize that the spoken word of God in the natural makes no sense that God spoke the world into existence. That the spoken word of God is so powerful that when you declare a thing, God begins to establish it. That we we know verses that say things like, you need to say to the mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and doubt not. That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of things that that we're talking about when we say, through faith, we understand. So you have this pull, this pull of faith, and it starts with people. And then secondly, it has to have an understanding. If you don't understand how God operates and what timing He operates on, and you don't understand that he was there all the time. Every struggle, he was there waiting patiently. He was there all the time, the old song said. Waiting patiently, patiently in line. He was there all the time. I heard a, quickly, I'll tell you a story. Heard a testimony from a gentleman who's a pastor now, but he, he died and he, he went in for some surgery and they did not realize that an infection uh, didn't get cleared up prior to. And I was watching his testimony on YouTube and he said, I died. I have the documentation. I stayed dead for uh, an hour and 45 minutes. And it's an impossibility that I'm here. But he said, I'm telling you, I have the medical documentation and I can tell you everything I saw. And this is the one of the things he said that stuck with me. He said, When I was there with the Lord, the one thing I knew was, and he said, it just became so evident. He didn't say it. He said, I just knew it. Like in me, I just knew there was never a moment that he wasn't there for me. Like never a moment that he wasn't there. Not even a second that he wasn't there for me. Not even a nanosecond that I couldn't call on him. Hallelujah. So you got to understand how God works. And some people, they have the, what they believe is an understanding, but to get a God understanding and understand that through faith, that's where our understanding begins. It's like saying, it's like saying um, to have a peace that passes all understanding, you've got to give up your right to understand. That's a different kind of understanding. That's understanding a thing By faith. In other words, he's going to give me peace that passes my logical mind. My logical mind. And then talking about the pull of faith. Because I said last week, if you push on my faith, I'll push back. If hell pushes on my faith, I'll push back. 
But today I'm talking about the pull of faith. Where you begin to pull on some things in the spirit. You begin to not only surround yourself with the people that will help you pull, that will be with you and pull for you. Um, you know, there's, there's something about having a cheering section. And if you don't know anything else, there's a great cloud of witnesses. Right now, Hebrews says this. All around us in the unseen realm, there's a great cloud of witnesses. And if you could hear them, they're saying, run on, man of God. Run on, man of God. Keep moving forward. Hold to God's unchanging. They're cheering. They're, they're, they're like the old guy, who, who the, the boy who ran the touchdown, and his daddy used to run every step of the way with him. You would see his dad when he was in little ball, and he would get the ball, and daddy would run with him all the way. If you just knew that daddy's running with you today. Daddy's running with you today. You say you don't, you don't, there's some things in the unseen. There's angelic forces. There's things in the unseen that you don't even recognize are happening today. By the same token, there's some things in the unseen that will take you to a place you don't want to go. You need to learn to discern some things and understand how that works. So understanding, so there's the, the people, there's the understanding. Then what I talked about earlier was the language of Faith, the language of faith. Acts 2.17 says this. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Because I am a, a Pentecostal charismatic, you might believe that I thought that the language of the Spirit was You had thought that might be my language of the Spirit. But that's not exactly what the Word says. That's a prayer language. That's something that God gives me. That's still the perfect prayer. I can still pray in the Spirit. And the Bible says when I do that, I build myself up on my most holy faith. But I don't want to talk to you about that language today. I want to talk to you about a language in the Spirit where God begins to give you some things. Acts chapter 2 verse 17 says it like this. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. The language of the spirit is visions and dreams. The language of the spirit, the way God relates to us is God will give you a vision. You say, you're talking about something that just appears kind of like something in a cartoon. No, no, no you'll begin to see yourself going in a different direction. You'll begin to see even, uh, can we say it this way, even almost a holy imagination where you begin to see yourself walking in the will of God. You begin to see yourself talking differently. You begin to have a vision and a dream and God will put a dream and a vision in your heart to make a difference or to see life change. There's a language in the Spirit. And I want to show you this, if I can find it very quickly. I didn't uh, put this, uh, um, I don't think I put this up there, but uh, if I can find it real quick, I'm going to talk to you very quickly out of, I want to say it's 1 Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. And I want you to see this because this is important. If you don't hear anything else, listen to this. There are things that people say that just in one moment of time, you see it. And if you're not careful, something will stick. It will stick. And And uh, verse 1 says this, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. So Elijah started killing the prophets of Baal. He started killing the prophets. And Ahab goes back to Jezebel and tells what he's done. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, Listen, somebody out of nowhere just shows up. After he's killed all of these prophets, if you go back to the previous verse, 1 Kings chapter 18, you'll realize that 
I mean, this man was, he was putting them down. One of the greatest victories that a prophet of the Lord has ever recorded, 1 Kings chapter 18. Sometimes when you come off your greatest victories, you need to be aware. So he goes to the, he goes and th- this person shows up. Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make thy, not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Let me give you the real quick paraphrase of that. She just said, if I don't do to you what you did to all those prophets, may God kill me. And here's what happened. She said, now she just sends a messenger. I don't, they don't tell who this person is. It's a messenger of Jezebel. <clears throat> yes, she's a controller and a manipulator. And she wants to strike fear in your heart. So she sends this messenger. And I want you to see this next verse in verse 3. And look what happened. And when he saw it, Jezebel sends a messenger. The messenger said, Jezebel's coming to kill you. And when he saw it. I'm talking about dreams and visions. I'm talking about somebody speaking one word and you beginning to see, yes, on this case, it's the, it's the, the bad, the negative. And the reason I point that out is one person can say one, you can, it, it, all you have to do is listen to one negative, non-believing nonsense of a person and they'll talk you out of everything. You just, you just killed, I don't know how many, 450, I think. You just killed all these prophets by yourself. And a woman, one woman, she didn't even show up herself. She sent somebody. She sent a messenger, and she said, I'm coming for you, boy. And what he should have done was by the Holy Ghost, he should have said, you better bring yourself on out here. You better come on because if you push on my faith, I will push back. Girl, I will cut your head slap off. You bring that nonsense on out here. But listen, he didn't say that. He didn't guard himself and he didn't say that. What he did was is the Bible says that when he saw it, she said it, he saw it. This is how faith works. The pastor can say something. The prophet can say something. You can read it out of the word. God can say it. But it begins to take root when you can receive it and see it. Because in this case, he saw it. And look what he does. He saw it. And he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. This is what he said. Bubba, you better stay here because if she's coming after me, you don't want to be nowhere around. He's already, he's already distancing himself from the people that could help him. He's already think about how the enemy works. She sends a messenger, he sees it, receives it, and he gets up immediately. He, he could have just said, you know what, I'm going to eat me a couple pieces of chicken and some mashed potatoes and have, get, get me some water. And you tell, you tell Jezebel I'm over here at such and such cave. And if she wants some of this, you tell her to bring it. That's almost the attitude of faith you have to have. When something comes your way, you have to say, my God is bigger than than anything you can bring my way. There's nothing impossible for God. This is how faith works. You got to understand there's a language of the Spirit. And here's what happens when you can get a vision for something. You can't let anybody, if God gives you a vision for something, don't let anybody talk you out of that. Look, you can get all kinds of visions and some of you have all kinds. But today I want to stir up your holy imagination. I want to, uh, what one, one verse in the Bible says, stir up your pure mind. 
I came this morning with an anointing to stir up your pure mind and to let you see what God can do, that there is victory. I'm not trying to get to victory. I'm already at victory. I'm standing my ground, and I'm telling every Jezebel, bring it on. You know I'm, yeah, say that with me. Say, bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. (laughs) There's a language, and when you understand the language of the Spirit, one word can change everything. We used to sing a song around here. I'll sing it right quick for some of you who weren't there back then, but we used to sing, just one word is all we need. A second touch, Lord, we believe will change everything. Change everything. Why? Because if you get a word from God, And you see it with your spirit, child. It changes everything. Changes everything. You might be living in hell this morning, but march right on out of that hell because one word's going to change everything. Change everything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then lastly, I'll let you go home on this one. There's a pull, P-U-L-L, it's people, understanding language. And then lastly, it's a level. God wants to take you to another level. God wants to elevate you. He wants to pull you up out of the muck and the mire. He wants to, he wants to elevate you to another level. If, if you were to understand that Hebrews chapter 6 says this, Hebrews 6 and verse 1 says, Leaving therefore the principles of the doctrines of Christ. Now, if I were to preach that, if I'd have got up this morning and said, Look, we're going to leave the principles of the doctrines of Christ, most people would have thought me a heretic. But the writer of Hebrews said, Leaving the principles. Well, when you understand what the word principles means, you begin to understand that that means the elementary, the... the um, how can we say this? The, the first things. There has to come a time that you grow up and you graduate from third grade faith to eighth grade faith to tenth grade faith to master's degree faith to what's up, Doc? What's up, Doc? How you doing? You got you to gotta grow up in your faith. Because every time something, every time you get one of them Jezebel words, you got to say, I ain't even trying to hear that. I don't even care what y'all say. I ain't trying to hear that. I'm not going to receive that. Let, let me help you practice. When somebody says something, uh, um, we're going to practice. Here's what you got to say. I don't receive that. Let's practice together. Say it. I don't receive that. Say it again. I don't receive that. Or as Elvis said it, Return to sender, address unknown, no such number, no such home. I don't know the words because I don't listen to enough of the song. But you do have to learn how to say, uh, that package right there, you can take that right on back where it came from because that ain't coming in this house. That's on you. So there has to be a pull. I'll let you go. I promise. There has to be a pull. There has to be the right people. We are that people. You are that person. I want you to go out tomorrow and find somebody to encourage. Find somebody. Yeah, but I need encouragement. I know you do. I know you do. I know you do. But Job 42.10 says if you'll find somebody, find some old lady in Walmart and give her an encouraging word. Find somebody to encourage Get your mind off you for just a minute and pray for somebody. Say, ma'am, if she's hobbling around Walmart, just say, ma'am, I'd love to pray for you because I believe God can heal you. You might get your captivity turned the minute you pray for You need people. Got to have people. Got to have understanding. Got to have language. And you got to have the next level. So what he's saying here is not that we're leaving. He's saying we're building off of that foundation that is Christ. We don't, we don't stay on ground level. We go from third grade faith. We go from milk 
to meat to hidden manna. We go from third grade faith to fifth grade faith to eighth grade faith to high school faith. Got to go into that next level. You got to go into that next level. And a part of it is, is just understanding that he's called you up higher. He's, 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 he said, come up higher. Come on up higher. I got something better for you. There's a pool of faith. And when you understand how the pool of faith works and you begin to work it, you begin to work it the way God wants you to work it, you'll be amazed at how he'll respond. Can I ask you to stand on your feet, please? Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Would you just say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. Completely, yes. I'll say, yes, Lord. Completely, yes. From the bottom of my heart to the depth to the depth of my soul, I'll say yes, Lord, completely yes. From the bottom of my heart to the depth of my soul, I'll say yes, Lord. Anybody going to say yes? Completely yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. To your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Would you give him a yes, Lord, one more time? Would you give him a yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Say it out of your mouth. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Completely yes. Hallelujah. If you need prayer this morning, please don't leave. These altars are open right now. We're waiting on you. We're waiting on you to come. There's forgiveness. There's healing. The altar is open. I'm going to pray and ask God to touch you. If there's somebody in here that needs to come forward and just say, I need God. I need help. I need the Lord to do something in my life that I cannot do for myself. Father, in the name above every name, we take authority over every force of hell. We take authority over every attack of the enemy on minds and hearts, on futures and destinies. Thank you, Lord. And I thank you that you set the captive free, not only in this house, but in this community and in this great state. God, we thank you for full surrender as we surrender all that we are and all that we ever will be to who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.